Well, I am very excited to introduce um, Volker Witt. Um, he's our uh, speaker today. Um, I've known Volker now for um, several years, and Volker is the medical director for the APHRESIS unit at St. Anna Kinderspittel um, in Vienna, Austria. So he's coming to us um, across the pond, as they say, um, today. And um, he is a world expert on apheresis and particularly the use of it and issues related to conducting apheresis in children and um, stem cell collections in children. Um, he's uh, been very involved in the apheresis um, fields around the world, and he's been active in the World Apheresis Association Apheresis Registry. He's an been um, an author on the last two editions of the American Society for Apheresis Therapeutic Apheresis Guidelines, which are the, you know, the main document that everyone uses to help guide therapy around the world. Um, and so uh, he's going to talk to us today, and I'm really excited to have Volker here because also Andy Johnson and I have been working closely with um, Volker on a project, and I really appreciate his input, bringing in some the kind of European perspective uh, into our project called Apheresis in the U.S. So with that, I'll let Volker get started. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And it's uh, very uh, an honor to be with you. And uh, so I hope you can see all in the right way my my presentation. I'm, I like to go... Um, to what I'm doing. So I want to talk about Ephesus and children, what we do in Vienna. I'm originally from Germany. So I'm living in, in Vienna since uh, roughly 30 years. And so um, my experience in Vienna is uh, where I'm uh, the leading uh, uh, physician in the Ephesus department. To start with something very, very important, especially for pediatrics, uh, pediatricians, and I am a pediatrician as to understand what we are doing with apheresis. We just take something away and nothing else. And uh, in Germany, we have uh, um, two um, words for it, either blood washing or blood cleaning. And blood Washing is more for dialysis and blood cleaning is more for apheresis. And you can imagine both both terms are not quite describing uh, the correct way what apheresis is because it's just taking something away. And to realize what can we take away, this is all we can take away, nothing else. So we are dealing with blood and blood is the thing we uh, have to have our pathogens in the blood, otherwise we won't, won't get them out from the patient. Or when we want to uh, give him healthy cells, uh, we only can give him blood cells with the apheresis and nothing else. We can don uh, a patient can donate cells or a donor can donate cells. And you see that we can do so many things with different kinds of parts of the blood. Um, so we can use platelet-rich factors and plasma for, for wound healing. We can use the white blood cells for different therapies, up to CAR T cells and the red blood cells we can give for transfusion. So the way around the patient thinks about apheresis, the therapeutic apheresis is what can we do for the patient well in his blood. And the opposite from the donor side perspective is what can the donor give us for to, to create a treatment for a patient. So there is everything, this triangle between apheresis, donor, and therapeutic. So apheresis is not only dealing with the patient alone, but also sometimes with the donor. Um, interestingly, um, you see what in Europe is the most often used um, apheresis machines are in transfusion medicine or in nephrology. And you might miss the pathology because the pathology in Europe is not the pathology in America. It's not a clinical pathology. It's just the pathology uh, from, uh, from the laboratory point of view. So... And you are missing the pediatricians, and I have to claim that the pediatricians are not very often part of the apheresis society. 
if we go for the diseases, we see that uh, we can use apheresis in hematology and oncology, but also in intensive care for supportive care and different types of machines and procedures which are listed here. And this gives, gives a, a little overview of what, what is possible. Coming back to me, I'm in the St. Anna Children's Hospital, which is a hematological oncologic um, um, a clinic for children and young adults. So we are using roughly all of these kinds of therapies and treatments for our patients. The basic signs for apheresis are clearly uh, we are dealing with blood. So blood is one of the thing we have to understand in basic science, but also physics are very important because physics are so important. We have to learn what happens when we centrifuge blood. We know that that uh, it is uh, um, then divided in its different parts, but the side effects we should uh, also have in mind what we do when we centrifugate. Uh, the first apheresis machine was this machine. This was used for milk to make butter from milk. And uh, the cream was the end product. So now is the, for example, the, the stem cells are our cream in the, in the days today. And these are the, the machines we are dealing with. Some of them are you, you are familiar with. I think the most of you know the Optia. Uh, we are, have in, in Europe also the Amico system very often, the, the, the Comtech system, but also other systems uh, which can be used for apheresis treatments. And these are the physics. The, the harder you centrifuge, the, the better you can divide the cells. So if you have a high G uh, centrifugation, then you have clearly here the, the layers of, of the cells, the, the platelets, the plasma, and the erythrocytes. So if you want to have only erythrocytes, it's good to have a high G and a good plasma quality you have also with high G. And the systems anatomically are these. Why I'm showing you this this systems because you need to fill them with blood and that's the point for children if you fill this with blood this is the blood which misses in the patient during the procedure so uh it's very important to have in, in mind that an extracorporeal circus should not be more than 10 percent of the full blood volume or 20 percent of the whole erythrocyte uh, volume having during the procedure in the in the uh, system. Otherwise, the patient would have symptoms of dilution and of anemia. So that's something we have to have in mind. We have to calculate in children, and to, we have to pre-fill the systems in uh, when uh, the extracorporeal volume exceeds the limits I told you uh, with blood. So the to go more into detail for the systems, we have the Optia system. This is something uh, we have in, in our department. And the reason is simply here, we can make different types of procedures with one system. And you see here, the, the mechanism is, is clearly, you can have the red cells, the white cells and the plasma um, in a very good quality uh, produced. And you have in the old MNC, protocol for the for the for the optia another type of um, separation this is called illustration the the g force goes from this to this and the flow from the product goes from bottom to the top so uh, you have a flow of different big particles against the g force that means bigger cells are remaining here, lower cells are remaining here. And so the light things are going out. So you can separate after the big separation in, in, the, in the centrifuge by elutation, much more easier the different cell types. And this is the same, you see that, that you can make a more clean product when, if, if you use the elutation chamber in the, in the Optia. And this is what we use, for example, for, for stem cells very, very often to have a more cleaner product.
The Amico system uh, is another system for, for separation. It's had a different type of centrifuge. Uh, but as you can see here, the, the, the principles are much more like in the other systems. So we are coming back to, to what we are doing when we are not centrifugation uh, separation. What, what we are, can we do? We can make plasma uh, filtration. And this like making coffee. This is what the Germans learned from the Americans after the Second World War, how to make the coffee. And I grew up with this coffee. And I think uh, this is... Um, this is uh, one of the best coffees I like to have, but the system of plasma phrase by filtration is roughly the same. You fill in the blood and the pathogen, so the, 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 the coffee per se is remaining in the filter and it comes out the pure coffee to drink. The best solution for a filtration system is roughly uh, this one, and, but we cannot make it artificial. So plasma freezes by filtration systems are made by these columns. These kind of columns, they are the, the, the blood comes from the top to the bottom and the filter gives then the plasma out here. And here's the replacement for, um, uh, solution for the plasma you, you take away. One of the things which is in filtration so nice is that after the first separation here, you can make a second column to make a second uh, filtration, double filtration uh, system. And here you can see wh why why it, why it's so nice. If you if you if you want to have the green ones and we don't want to have the red ones, if we make one filtration, and this is depending on the uh, on the pore size, we have green and red. So to get the red out, we use double filtration. So in the, in the second column here, it comes through. So the, the, the filter plasma goes here and due to the pore size, the green comes in, this comes, this returns to the, to the patient and the, the middle uh, weight goes out to the waste. And at least to, I don't want to confuse you, but this is also a, a type of separation um, I will show you the, uh, what we, we do with that is the filtration and the rotation. So the rotating disc um, separator from life, uh, which is used for plasma freezes and for column treatments like IgG absorption and so on. The plasma filtration, you see here that these are machines who are used in intensive care. It's a Prisma Flex. And... Um, these filtration systems are um, often used also in nephrology. So filtration is more used in nephrology than, than in, 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 in other parts uh, of the medicine. So bringing this together, we, we talked about we can make cell uh, separation, we can make erythrocytes coming out, the pathology, uh, patho pathological erythrocytes we give up, we, we throw away, for example, sickle cells and the fresh ones, we go back to the, to the, to the patient, we can make a plasma exchange and we can make this double filtration. So we have the first separation from the plasma, the plasma plus pathogen, and then uh, we put the plasma gene minus pathogen back to the patient. What we learned is that plasma exchange is due to the fact that so many factors are in the plasma which are pathological for neuroimmunological diseases. This is really something we use plasma exchange very often in US and in Europe. And the question is, does it, uh, uh, is plasma exchange the only one we, we have to use or can we use other types of machines also in this case? So how do we do it in, 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 uh, with a replacement fluid when we make plasma exchange? It's written in the literature that saline solution was, was used. This makes a dilution problem by, for the, for the 
uh, coagulation system, but also for the for the protein system. You can use human albumin there. You have a dilution for the coagulation sy system, or you have fresh frozen plasma. So you have to go to your patient and have make the decision uh, which kind of replacement fluid you uh, want to use. In children, we are using human albumin and fresh frozen plasma, and mostly we start with human albumin for the for two third of the procedure, and in the last part, we use fresh frozen plasma to avoid any coagulation problems in the ill patient. Uh, what we have to have in mind when we make plasma exchange is that we only can, can treat the intravascular compartment. And there is, a, there is a connection between the intravascular compartment and the extravascular compartment and the tissue. So the success depends how much comes back from the extravascular compartment and the intravascular compartment after the treatment. So how much can I really um, take out the pathogen from the intravascular compartment? And here, this is the mathematics behind. You can see that, that uh, with one procedure, you can roughly, with one uh, treating one times the plasma volume, you can roughly take out 66% of the pathogen. And if you make it, once a day over many days, then you come more and more to a very low uh, amount of of uh, of um, pathogen after, for example, here four days. If you make two, then you come here more down, and you have after two days roughly no pathogen anymore in the patient. To show you this. Uh, uh, a little more in, in, in detail. Um, when we exchange plasma, then what is the part we want to bring out? Mostly it's an IgG we want to bring out. And this is roughly only a part of the whole plasma. And the pathogen is much more less. Uh, and the real pathogen is the lowest amount. So sometimes it makes sense not to ex exchange the whole plasma, but to give uh, the, uh, to take out this pathogen. And how can we do that? This we can do by immune absorption columns. And this is the, the scheme behind. It works that we pump the blood through a column and then it goes back. The pathogen is adsorbed here in specific columns. We can absorb IgG, IgE. We can uh, absorb also isoagglutinin A or isoagglutinin B. Uh, we can absorb also CRP. We can absorb different types of cytokines. So it makes sense to, to, to take the plasma through this column. At a certain time, this column will be fully absorbed all what the column can. And the question is, should we then stop the procedure? No, we, we can make it with a trick. We take now the second column and go here through the plasma. And during uh, when one column is out of the circus, we can take fluids and we can, sorry, we can uh, clean this column up so we can use the first column, then the second column, the first column is cleaned, while we use the second column, then the first column, the second column is cleaned, and so on and so on. And with this system, we can um, make procedures up to six liters to 10 liters, depending what we want to have uh, bring out of the patient, uh, which pathogen we want to bring out. So, um, we can bring a um, um, myasthenia gravis patient from, from a high titer of IgG to, to roughly no uh, measurable titer afterwards with these machines. So you see that um, with the immune absorption, you have much more um, possibilities to, to, to treat larger amounts. Lipid apheresis is a little bit like immune apheresis. Uh, so there you can also treat much more higher uh, amounts of, of plasma. 
And this we can do also in children. And then children make sense because uh, when you treat a child with 10 kilograms, then you have uh, uh, roughly 400 milliliters to 500 milliliters plasma. And so if you make six times, you have three liters, which can run through the machine. And that makes sense to, to, to spare a little bit of therapies. This is the scheme we use normally for, for our plasma treatments. We start with one, one after the next day, then the maintenance, and then we taper in months some diseases. I give you an example with a patient with acute demyelinizing encephalomyelopathy. Uh, he came to us with four, seven uh, month old uh, male boy, and he had this type of Adam here visible in the in the MRI. He had antimyelin, oligodendrocyte, glucoprotein, mock antibodies in a title of one to 320. What we know about mock is that these are making disease. These are disease-making antibodies. And so what we can do with these antibodies, we can bring them out. So we don't stop the production, but we bring them out so that uh, the disease-making antibody is not able to make more disease at that point. And this is, for example, the scheme we treated him we treat it also at the same time with dexamethasone uh, to stop the production of the, the, the antibodies. We give him IV, IgG. Uh, we start with TPE, but then we, we change to, to, to the columns um, and we could taper that. Uh, so the patient was at the PICU, but never, um, never intubated. And four months later, he had minimal dysautria, no ataxia, no nystaxis, and, and he went back to school. To give you an overview, this was just one case to show what, what we are doing in children uh, with this immune absorption and TPE. We are combining this. Uh, this is my hospital. This is, my, my, this is our main entrance. And you see children are taking away everything they can take away. Here is missing one ball. And... This is how many apheresis we made since we started in 1996. You can see that um, up to now, we are uh, uh, roughly 6,000 um, over 6,000 6, procedures in children. And you can see that ECP is, this is the gray bar here, is our main thing we are using uh, um, in children because we have a bone marrow stem, stem cell uh, transplantation unit so that the GVHD is one of our my main goals uh, for uh, cell apheresis procedures and therapeutic apheresis. So what's about evidence-based? Nicole talked about the, the, the ASFA guidelines. I think everyone is familiar with that. Uh, I had the chance to, 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 to start 2000. Um, uh, uh, with the, the, the sixth edition. So I did now my last edition. So um, we have these guidelines also in, 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 in Austria as our main guidelines. So US and Europe are here very close together. And the next issue is in 2023. And this is where we did it. This is, uh, where's Nicole? Here is Nicole and the rest of the team who wrote. And uh, very important, the, 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 the queen of the, the, the um, all is, is uh, Nancy Dunbar. And you see that it was so important that the American guidelines are very structured so that everyone can, can find his things, the description of the disease, the current management, the rationale for therapeutic apheresis. So in a very, very short time, you get an overview about your disease. You have to go in the literature for, for understanding the disease might be a little bit more better, but, but so the success of the guidelines is the structure of the, of the fact sheets. Combination, combination of apheresis and something else, what we are doing in, in, in pediatrics. This is uh, an older slide, but I think it's the best slide. This is the old COPE and this is the old Prismaflex. And we have here a patient with an um, Grafen syndrome. He had a uh, multiple organ uh, 
failure syndrome. The, he has a liver failure, uh, a renal a kidney failure. He has a, uh, also a gut failure. And, and uh, so he was in, intubated. He has an RDS. He has a pulmonary uh, failure. And what we did is we gave him for the fluid management on the on the on the continuous renal replacement therapy, and f to 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 fight against the hyperinflammation in this situation, we make plasma exchange. And how we do that? We make with if this is the patient, the, the blood comes out. We go then with part of the the blood to the apheresis machine. This goes back to the dialysis system, and. This goes then back to the patient. Why we do this? It's very simple. This is citrate anticoagulated. This is citrate anticoagulated. If you first go through the apheresis machine, make a plasma exchange. Plasma is citrate. You don't need any citrate anymore here in the dialysis system. And the dialysis system give, takes out the citrate. So here comes no citrate to the patient. So that's the reason that you can make a citrate anticoagulation in a liver failure, which is normally forbidden to do. But with this system, we are able in children to make uh, F, uh, regional anticoagulation to avoid uh, bleeding complications from heparin and other anticoagulators um, to bring this patient over this disease. Um, septic shock, there, there is also... Um, uh, sepsis and bacterial infection that's very it's every time the question can we take also donor granulocytes in a in a column yes we can uh this is done so far uh we asked ourselves whether we can also make um spleen or liver ex this is just a picture was never realized uh, but this these are the ideas we are dealing with and now we are working together with the university in Krems um, and in Modena to realize we make organoids. Um, they have, uh, for example, here, uh, liver organoids. They are filled in in the column and they are, uh, uh, the, the plasma goes through this column and so far in the in the in the few uh, animal experiments, it's, it works very well to bring out um, the liver toxic agents and to restore a little bit the liver function um, is possible. Maybe we can do it in men in a few years. And the same is true for other other organs we can 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 uh, replace. For example, we have also a group which which works about. Uh, kidney organoids to, to restore kidney um, uh, function. There is, for example, the kidney organoids are, are on the layer there. So to become more serious, if we want to have aphorism in children, we need a venous success. And how should we do that in this tiny, small children? Um, we need a sufficient blood flow. It should not coagulate uh because the anticoagulants comes after the venous success otherwise we should we we should anticoagulate the patient the returning blood needs uh, a venous success and should be compatible the procedure should make sense for the patient and we should know that might be the result if we want to have harvest the cells so these is things uh, are very important. The last is, in, in we have to calculate how much time we need for cells, for example, or when we have a pathogen in, in plasma treatment, for example, we have to calculate how long should we treat the patient to bring down the pathogen. Venix success is very important. We can make peripheral venix success. This is very, even in intensive care, we use it because it's a low flow uh, treatment in contrast to uh, continuous renal replacement treatment. So if the patient has no CRRT, we use apheresis even in, in, in patients intubated by peripheral venous success, which are then made by uh, ultrasound guided. This is to, to the blood flows. To, and 
the central venous access systems in, in children are otherwise um, roughly the same as in adults. And we use in, 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 in PICU the, the, the uglar veins, the, 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 the subclavian veins. But in children, uh, when they have a Hickman or Brovik catheter, then we use the Hickman Brovik catheter. And you see here a Y piece, so we can use one uh, soft Hickman catheter is one big catheter uh, line. So that makes sense. And as a return line, you see here, we use also peripheral venous success. This is normally done, um, um, this ROSA is, uh, is, is uh, for uh, ladies and for young adults. But you can see that uh, you can bring them also in very small children to make a freezes procedure possible. We stick also our patients by needles when they want. And what we do is uh, in special circumstances, I come back to the mini ECP a little bit later, uh, we take arterial uh, uh, lines here in the radius. She was a patient with GVHD who denied to have a, um, a, a central venous line. So we take the arterial blood and we give it back here in a very, very small um, vein uh, after the procedure. This is a 27 and 29 gauge uh, needle and it, the treatment was successful so far. You see, these are the very small uh, uh, vein flaws we are using. The guidelines on the other hand are here described. I think this is very, the most of you and anesthesiologists are com uh, familiar with that. So this is the French and the body weight is, there's a clear uh, uh, correlation about. What you have to, to know is if you use uh, central venous catheters or peripheral veins uh, catheters, in 87%, there is a fibrin layer on it. And this is the reason why we use, for example, ectolyze um, atepitectase before we start a procedure to, 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 to open this to make it feasible. And especially in, in children, when you use it every after day, um, most of our treatments, we use one venous success at least for two weeks to, to make these procedures. And here you can see the, the therapeutic lysis. You see here, there is this, this uh, contrast comes back here, the fluid, and here the fluid goes down after the treatment. So uh, it makes sense to, to, to treat your catheter Anticoagulation, I'm, I told you we use citrate because it's uh, the biochemistry is so nice in, in our body that we have uh, CO2 and water at the end of the day. And um, the side effects are very good manageable. And why and how should we make it? Um, if we, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, if we make cellular uh, um, hemophoresis, we have to think about we harvest or we waste uh, cells. So when we harvest cells, we need a minimum of citrate for our target cells to survive until they are processed. When we waste them, we can take lower amounts of, of uh, citrate because we waste the cells. This is, for example, true for, for red cell exchange. We have 1 to 14, 1 to 15 um, as a ratio. And in stem cells, we have 1 to 12 to make a, a good storage. Why is this important to use less? Because uh, if you go to children, here's the body weight, uh, then you have to have in mind that um, 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 the dose of citrate is is not every time the same in the in the system. If you go to lower body weight, the systems and this is the example for Amicus and 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 Fanwald CS three thousand the, the the former system. The same is true for Optia and Cope. The higher the dose of ACDA is, so and this makes sense to to to. Uh, to, um, uh, to, to be aware that in children, the dose of citrate is much more higher. Um, we validated um, 
there is the risk of hypocalcemia and how much um, is, is it in our patient. So we, we, we saw that even in saline uh, priming or blood priming in very small children, there is no statistical significant difference. But how we can avoid this by calcium substitution. And so we make a dose finding uh, study about it. And you can see that giving more than 0.03 uh, millimole per kilogram per hour, we have less hypocalcemias than we would expect. So this is the dose we, we give. And you see what happens in the different kinds of, of um, groups here, the, the young adults here, the the children and here the very young children under 10 kilograms by blood priming. You see the calcium is rising because this is a substitution of calcium and the ionized calcium is, is, is lowering but never under uh, 1.0 um, uh, millimole per, per liter so they don't have any symptoms. Um, and the difference is very interesting. What is the difference? Uh, the calcium total goes up and the calcium unitized goes up. And uh, the reason is, this is uh, the citrate. The citrate binds here and it has to be metabolized. So you have a lower unitized calcium because you have bounded, bound uh, total um, calcium to a citrate. Even the albumin goes down after a procedure. The substitution, therefore, what we choose is uh, two milliliters from this solution, one 500 milliliters with 40 milliliters calcium gluconate with two milliliters per kilogram per hour. This is very easy for, for pediatricians to, to, to calculate. And so we do it. And since then, we had never seen any hypercalcemia in our department. So it's very hard to train our our, our colleagues, how it looks like, because we don't have it anymore. Uh, in, the, in the literature, it's known to, to do that. There's every time a discussion about magnesium, should we, should we not. We measure the, the, the magnesium before when it's low, we do it. Uh, we have a combined solution in Europe, um, calcium and magnesium. But this is uh, only in cases where they have before the procedure in hypomagnesium here. The type of venous excess in children is very interesting. These are the data from the WAA registry. Old data and newer data are completely the same, so I did, didn't make a new uh, slide on it. Half of them are with peripheral venous excess, very ill patients, especially plasma exchange in the ICU, they have a CVC. So in total, what does this mean? Mostly you don't need to, to propagate for apheresis in children really a new CVC in our hands. Um, it depends on your politics. It depends on, on, on your logistics, how you make it. But this is our experience so far. And now a little bit more uh, into detail, the physiology. Um, I talked talked not so much about children so far and special problems, but I talked about some, some different kinds of procedures, what you should um, be aware of in children. And this is, these children are the children we are treating. And the most important thing is gender politically uh, correct in 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 in, uh, in Europe, we now use male bodies and not any more female bodies. For this slide, um, is we have developing bodies. It's not only that they are get getting bigger; they are also developing. And so, if we go for the society, uh, we have to ask ourselves: Who gets apheresis? And there are some marginal groups, the older ones and the very youngs. And it's very interesting that we have more older, more elderly than young. And the elderly are more fitter. So today, a 70-year-old is fit as 20 years ago, at uh, 20 years ago, a 60-year-old. So we have also here um, a, a switch. And if you go to the registries, uh, then we see that 
In the young, there's 4.2% in the children of the procedure. In the elderly, defining it at more than 65 years, it's 26%. So using the freezes in children is very rare. And when we use plasma and we wanted to, to, to make uh, plasma treatment, very often uh, there is also acute liver fee and, and indication. Now it's a, it's a, it's a category two um, in, in, in the guidelines. Um, after this randomized study, the high uh, volume uh, was category one. Uh, discussed and this study brings up that treating patients with plasma exchange with high volume plasma exchange could uh, the patient could benefit in the direction of getting getting and graft granular transplantation or the liver failure is resumed uh, without in transplantation more often and if you go to the details you see um, it's interesting that it's the hemodynamics are better. This is what is significantly. The hemodynamics are really better. And after that, there is a, is a difference in, in survival. And this leads to, to, to the question, could it not only be by the acute on chronic liver failure or acute liver failure, like, like in this study, um, be done um, in acute uh, liver support? Um, when you when you use not plasma exchange but but for uh, continuous re replacement therapies or mass or uh, other treatment systems for for artificial liver support you have roughly the same situation as in tp you are uh, you have better uh, hemodynamics and so the recovery of the the liver could take place interestingly um, there are different um, systems on on the on the road, especially in, in in Asia and in Europe, with different hemofilter systems. And what we learned is um, in the 90s of the last century, TPE was one of the main steps. Then we combined it with other treatments, with with uh, high flow uh, uh, renal replacement therapies. And nowadays we are coming, the more high flow uh, renal replacement therapies we are using, uh, the less TPE is, is, is needed. So the small volume PE uh, has a better outcome at the end of the day as the high volume uh, TPE in, in the beginning. So the combination of TPE with uh, influencing the hemodynamics by by also renal replacement therapy seems to in this um, acute renal uh, acute liver failure very important. So this is an example for the for the situation. Never use TPE for your own. Never use TPE as as one treatment without support in another uh, uh, direction. So combining seems to be also in the literature much more better. I go over this. Now, uh, my last example is um, now the small patient and the big machines in the example of the ECP. The ECP is an extracorporeal photophoresis um, or sometimes called also chemotherapy, photochemotherapy because there is an agent used. Um, there is a long history of using uh, UVA light for treatment and this is the substance uh, from the from the leaves of this this uh, amamayus, um, and this is the principle of the extracorporeal photophoresis. You take your leukocytes, you harvesting your leukocytes, you are taking uh, eight methoxypyrroline from the leaves of this amamayus. Uh, then you take UVA irradiation and this is intercalating with the DNA and these cells are going in apoptosis and then you have phagocytosis and the DCs and APCs make a telorigenic reaction. So the pro-inflammatory cytokines are going down, the anti-inflammatory cytokines are going up, the, the T cell numbers 
might go up, but these are more helper uh, T cells than than other T cells, and the, the stimulation of the T cell effector cells goes down. So the GVHD, uh, the hip hyperinflammation in the GVHD goes down. Starting in 1970, uh, this principle was was uh, by Edelson uh, um, realized and. At that time, the patient took the 8-methoxyzorolein and then he lay in the sun. This is not a very, very um, good treatment. So in 1982, we learned to make methoxyzorolein, uh, to make it in a syringe. And 1987, the first aphoresis machine came on the market. Here you see the blood flowing through this lightning chamber with UVE light. And you can imagine that you need to have at, at minimum 70 kilograms to tolerate this machine um, with the extra couple volume. Then the principles of this extra couple photophoresis were collecting the leukocytes, taking 8, eight MOP, irradiated with UVA, and then re infuse it to the patient. So the patient don't have to take the 8 MOP anymore uh, orally, and all side effects could be avoided. And this is the principle uh, again. And the machines are coming more smaller and smaller and smaller. This is, these are the new variants of the UVAR. And uh, this is the Celex system, which is now used from the Terracos. But we in Europe, we have also the offline methods. So we use a leukophoresis system and an irradiation system and go back to the patient. And when we go to the extracorporeal systems, the volumes, then you see that that even the Celex system has high extracorporeal volumes. And so we are in the normal situation that if we want to treat children, we need maybe even not only the leukocyte aphoresis machines, uh, we, we uh, uh, took a manual method where we take 10 milliliters per kilogram body with peripheral blood. We are producing the MNCs, we take the 8 mob, we make the irradiation, go to the patient, and we treat these patients uh, with GVHD and very successfully. And from uh, uh, this is our first uh, program. So we make it, made the program body weight adapted. And in special cases, we made the manual system. And to realize all the schedules of, of ECP, it's very important to also look for the patient that he's able to follow it. It doesn't make sense to, 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 to fill up the machine every time with blood. So there is a good publication that with the UAXTS, one of the, the, the side effects in children from 12 to 20 kilograms was an over-transfusion of these patients. So we have to really think about this issues. And um, the schedule is a long lasting schedule. This is, you have to remember that this is not one aphoresis. These are 20, sometimes 30 aphoresis or 50 aphoresis in one patient. So we thought about it to adapt it uh, to patients. So why making two aphoresis on two consecutive days? Why not making one aphoresis, splitting the product and make it on two days. And the mini ECP, the manual method, but, uh, we look for the cell counts. Um, you see that the cell count is very low. The mini ECP in the offline is much more higher than in the inline. And then we compared our data in acute GVHD, for example, and we saw no statistically significant difference in the treatment of different patient groups uh, with different and uh, of, of the same patient group, but with uh, different systems. So the rock rock rank sum test, even these are small numbers of patients, show that there is no significant difference in the system uh, used for ECP. So in our hand, adapting the patient um, for the machine does not is not the best way, but adapting the system for the, for the patient might be the best way to do it. And we are treating in, in children just these small 
uh, uh, patient and you can see that this was the vein we used normally for treatment uh, and it was done uh, roughly 80 times. So you can see uh, it works also with mini ECP. And now she's, she's fine. So with this, I want to stop. I think we have 10 minutes for discussion. Thank you very much for your for your time and that you listen to me and yeah i'm free for questions thanks volker i'm always uh, amazed at how much more novelty we can um treat with um apheresis outside of the us using mini circuits and things that just aren't available even absorption isn't available and that do you think any of that is coming to the like to the full market? Because I know a lot of this is work that you've done just, you know, modifying techniques in-house. Is that coming to the market in your in Europe as well? Or uh, the all these procedures, for example, the ECP, there it's it's on the market in, 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 in Europe, but not in Asia and, and in America, but it's 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 a manual method. We published the SOP and the ASFA SOP book, so everyone can 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 use it if he is allowed to use it. And uh, for the immune absorption, I know that uh, the companies who are dealing with that have different minds to come to the American market because there is, as we know, the FDA. But for example, um, Miltinil is is now have have good chance to bring their system, the Life Twenty One. To, to US, the FD seems to, to be um, not overwhelming positive, but seems to be positive to, to, to let them through. And as I know, they are now making studies in, in, in US to, uh, for the immune absorption so to have American data, um, real data. So, because I'm thinking that's very important. So, and my suggestion is that that the Life Twenty One will come in the next two years to to US market for fixed, uh, so that there is an immune absorption uh, system on the market. And this is very flexible because uh, we have up to twenty five different types of columns in the system to use. So that should work good. That'd be great because currently there really isn't immune absorption yeah. problems in the US. So that'll open up our market here for different things that we can treat in a different mm -hmm. way. But as I show you in the in the, in the case, the 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 first uh, the first two treatments, for example, in the in the um, Adam patient, we did also uh, in a hurry we did we made two TPEs because it works. And then to 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 avoid more treatments. Uh, we we switched to, to to immune absorption. And I think that's that might be the way to do it in the future for a for a critical situation where you have to to react very soon and very early. And I think neurological diseases sometimes are these diseases where you have to to react very very in a short time. Uh, TP is a is a wonderful method, but then on the on the on the mean run. On the mid run, you uh, I want to avoid the, the term mid term <laughs> because <laughs> I think you you have elections. Um, <laughs> the the in the mid -term, mid uh, time uh, it's very important to, to to make as as low as possible for the for the procedures uh, for the patient um, to avoid side effects to avoid wasting time for the patient because you make one immune absorption instead of three TPEs. So uh, it's not so time consuming also for your, for your stuff. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Hey Volker, it's Andy Johnson. Um, I was wondering, you had made reference to um, with your central lines uh, that you do, do you do a TPA or some sort of alt place for fibrin sheets? Do you do that with every single procedure? Are you doing that every time or just when flows are backing up or is that a, a routine part of your practice to have, I, I say TPA because that's usually what I'm using here whenever we have flow issues. 
Um, that's our. It's it's the nurses are doing that. So so it's it's our routine to do that. And 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 ninety five percent, we 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 can clear the cathedral and and then it works very good. Okay. The point is the point is most of of the people are doing it in the cathedral. Wait forty minutes, thirty minutes, depending on the on the atepletase you use. What we do, we 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 give an, a very slow infusion. Mm -hmm. So uh, then you reach the the fibrin uh, sheet because it's outside the cathedral, it's not in the cathedral. Perfect. And the dose is so small that that even in ten kilogram children it doesn't matter anything. I know I've had to do that math once in a while when I get anxious about wait a minute how much of a <laughs> how much of a dose yeah. am I giving yeah. it's it's not quite the same as uh, the yeah. direct dose for stroke prophylaxis and things like that and realizing that no this is a a whiff that is getting out into a whole body yeah yeah that's true and that's the same true for very small children so so what what we are using is and it accidentally it can happen that 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 it's it's pulled in the in the in the in the, in the children this is one hour of, of our politics and the clinics uh, we make this this um, schedule so that there cannot happen anything what flow rates are you going at with your small kiddos knowing that you guys are doing a lot more peripheral than than I'll admit that we end up doing in our small ch children I think we end up gravitating towards a yeah. central line fairly frequently but are you able to go at fairly good speeds or what what are the peripheral veins able to handle yeah I, I can give you an example for for CAR T cells for example um, we've made not so much it's now roughly 30 procedures um, and treatments of CAR T cells um, and the best Results were done by peripheral venic success, even in heavily pretreated patients. So we go by ultrasound, take a really good, nice vein mm -hmm. in the arm. And especially in, in Optia, when you lose once the flow, then the layers are going around. So, so your efficiency is, goes down very, very, very uh, uh, for a longer time, so you need some time to to make this layer in the in the in the in the bowl, and then coming back to the to a good sufficient um, collection and harvesting the cells. So, what we learned is taking peripheral uh, venous success is especially in heavily pretreated patients. It's very nice. I don't know why, but. Um, when you go to pathology and the, and the when they are dead and you look for the for the for the central venous um, veins, um, especially in children treated the, fur, the not the first time but the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth time for a for an ALL with with two, three, up to six. Um, CVCs at the same time, you see that the the, the balls are not. That they are little thrombus on it, and so I think the central venous department is not the best for our mm -hmm. catheters. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering when when I realized this the first time, I said, because it's a it's a big it's a big vessel. There should be enough flow, but there are turbulence lenses, and uh, when the catheter is in in the turbulence, it doesn't not work very good. And that's very interesting to, yeah. to to realize. Very good, thank you. Other questions from the audience? All right, we're right up at the end of the hour here anyway. So I just wanna again, thank Volker for joining us all the way from Vienna uh, today. And we hope sometime you can come here and visit us in person at the university. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much, sure. Nicole, and have a, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.